delivery, go and throttle up. Go and throttle up.
Going throttle up. Good morning. It's uh, early. How's everybody doing? Oh, man. Did you get any sleep? Early for you, maybe. Yeah. Time zones do be like that. <laughs> Still up, Mutter? Nice. We could tell you just woke up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, we're up early here for the Falcon 9 SWAT launch. SWAT is a, um, it's an oceanographic mapping satellite that SpaceX is launching out of Vandenberg off, off Slick 4, Slick 4E in Vandenberg with a Falcon 9. Uh, this, this is a, it is a reused Falcon 9, uh, and it should be doing RTLS if I'm understanding this correctly. The Surface Water Ocean Topography Mission. So it's a satellite that was developed jointly by NASA and Kness, which is French Space Agency, in partnership with the Canadian Space Agency and the UK Space Agency. And the objectives of the mission is to make the first global survey of the Earth's surface water, observing the finer details of the, sur of the ocean's surface topography and measure how terrestrial surface water bodies change over time. Hmm. What core are we using here? So it's using B-1071, sixth flight, going to be landing at LZ-4, 72-day turnaround. This information is all off of uh, next space flight, by the way. PBR full, alleviate. Thank you for the resubs, guys. You guys have been more than generous this past month to me, and I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have the NSF coverage up here. There's a... There's a picture right there of the of a satellite. If I'll be honest, you're gonna ask me what all that stuff does? Don't know. Don't know. Solar panels and then maybe a synthetic aperture radar. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> Buds make the word night go by easier. Alright, right on, man. Thank you. There's a picture of the pad. It's actually not too foggy out in Vandenberg. It doesn't get foggy until the morning, guys, believe it or not. It, Vandenberg at night is very clear. Uh, very nice, clear clear skies, usually. Um, it does science stuff. Yep, yep, write that down. Write that down. 
the marine layer really pulls in in the morning if you if you if you go up there if you've been up there uh yeah so it's actually not too incredibly foggy that wouldn't that won't happen at Vandenberg for like another three hours <laughs> so hopefully we get a nice clear shot of this thing popping popping off not just ocean water but also rivers lakes and reservoirs cool man right on The first time I've been 10 minutes early at 6.30 in the morning in a long time. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, what kind of orbit is it going to here? Let me check. Let me check. Uh, this thing... I believe this is going... Well, it's it's probably sun-synchronous, if I, if I had to guess. Um, here, let's, let's, go, let's go over here and see if we can see. Low... Geocentric, low Earth orbit. Oh. 857 kilometers at 76.6 degrees. 77.6 degrees inclined. That's not sun synchronous. Uh, that is a polar orbit or a near polar orbit. It is prograde. It's a prograde orbit. So interesting. I wonder why it's going to that orbit. 857 is. That's I don't believe that's sun synchronous. I thought uh, 550 kilometers is sun synchronous more or less, but interesting, 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 interesting. Oh, look at that! Those things actually extend. Yeah, I wonder what those are. Oh yeah, here we go. It's an it, it's an interferometer. There's two of them. And a Nader altimeter right there, 10 meter baseline here. Whoa. That's really smart actually. Uh yeah, that's really smart. They're using the two interferometers to be a, and the the nadir altimeter to basically be able to come up with an image that's showing topography and surface water topography. That's 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 pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Hey Taco, what's going on, buddy? That's that's really neat, actually. Yeah. Primary instrument on SWAT is the K band, K band radar interferometer. It's called Karen. Sir, this is a, this is ma'am. This is a space launch. Yeah, synthetic aperture radar. That's what I thought. If you want to know what SAR is, so synthetic aperture radar is kind of like the new hotness in imaging terrain and stuff. That's something that's kind of been really becoming a thing over the last couple of years. So. It's a form of radar that's used to create two-dimensional images or three-dimensional reconstructions of objects. SIR uses the motion of the radar antenna over a target region to provide a finer spatial resolution than conventional stationary beam radar scanners. SIR is typically mounted on a moving platform such as an aircraft or spacecraft and has its origins in, advanced, in an advanced form of side-looking airborne radar. Yep, yep. Okay, so I actually do know what what a lot of those things do. Yep. It's the side fumbling radar. That's cool. When is the actual launch? Uh, very soon. Very soon. Uh, nice. That's really neat. All right. So let's let's pop in over here. Uh, SpaceX, SpaceX's stream should be up. Let me, let me, let me pop in and there we go. Some of that uh, liquid oxygen venting off now, okay. both the first and second Let's stages, see what right? We got. Yeah. And that, and you seeing that because the, the boost is very, very cool because that liquid oxygen is inside there. And, um, soon you hear the call out for stage one, uh, RPO leaks, they're wrapping up, um, fueling of, of the stage. 
um, of the stage one right now, and so we should hear that call out here in a few seconds. Stage one lock load is complete. And so SpaceX is also loading helium Stage gas fuel load correction. into both stages, and uh, we'll, con we'll continue to top off until about a minute and a half before launch. Uh, oh, yeah, th this is when NASA does their coverage over instead of SpaceX's coverage, and they... Yeah. The first stage has nine Merlin engines, hence the name Falcon 9. The second stage has a single Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine, so you'll often hear uh, references to MVAC throughout the count. Okay. Okay. Watching the NASA and especially the Ariane launch makes you appreciate the SpaceX coverage and care so much more. They really do spoil us, don't they? Yeah, it's pretty. Around, yeah. Just at the base of the cringe. payload fairing, you'll, you'll see those arms start to open, mm -hmm. and that will allow for the strong back to start tilting backwards. Yes, yeah, that is correct. You, you mind if I, if I do it? So... SpaceX is Slick 4E Transporter Erector, which is this gray structure that's behind me right here, is a, actually an old school style transporter erector. The modern ones that SpaceX has made, so the ones that are at Slick 40 in, at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, and the 39A Transporter Erector at Kennedy Space Center are all throwback styles. What they do is those arms open, and then the, the strong back, the, or the, the TE actually moves back just a little bit. And then when the rocket launches, it, it the hydraulics pull it away. The one at Vandenberg, the Slick 4E transporter erector, is actually one of the oldest transporter erectors that's in SpaceX's fleet. This thing is very, very old, like 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. It's, it's an old TE. It's an old piece of equipment. Um, that one is actually a retract, retract style, so it... It'll just retract to 78 degrees, and then the rocket will launch, and it'll just kind of sit there. If you're wondering about scale and you want to try to understand how big this thing is, look at the ladder right there. That should get you a pretty good indication of how big it is. It's a pretty big piece of equipment. Falcon 9 is, is pretty gigantic here. So, yeah, see, see the ladder all the way up there? What we should see now is uh, the transporter erector purge. This thing does carry the fuel lines, which you can see right there. That's the fuel line, fuel and oxidizer line for the second stage. And what SpaceX wants to do is basically they, they don't want liquid oxygen and liquid fuel inside of this thing when they go to launch the rocket because I don't know if you can tell, this thing gets kind of hot. It gets a little burnt, right? Like right in this area here, little ways down there. So what we should see when second stage liquid oxygen and RP-1 have been topped off, what they'll do is they'll take the RP-1 and they'll pump it out of the system and the liquid oxygen that's in there, they'll purge out that with nitrogen and it'll, it'll shoot gaseous oxygen out the back over here somewhere. Uh, that's a pretty dang good indicator that we are go for launch. Um, now, the cool thing is, is that if you look and see those lights over there in the background, those two, that's where this rocket is landing. It's landing at LZ4. Oh, there's your TE purge. Pretty good indicator that we are good to go. That means second stage lock load is topped off. Range is green. Okay. This Falcon 9, 1071, serial number 1071, first stage, should be landing right over there momentarily. Seriously. Yeah. That's where that's going to happen. All right, so I'm going to tee us in to the audio here with 60 seconds remaining. Uh, so it's that out, getting it all ready for, to go for launch. Falcon 9 is in startup. Okay. And we just heard that call up. Falcon 9 is in startup, which means the flight computer is taken over and is just preparing for its initial launch sequence. And now both stages are pressurizing for launch. Next call out in just a couple of seconds. 
They increase the tank pressures right before launch flight so they can get the launch. so they can SpaceX get proper flow rates into the, uh, go for into launch. the turbo pump Range inlets. remains go, weather is go. Launch director is good, 30 seconds. Here we go, guys. Early morning launch. Get your coffee ready. Hey, Creeper. This launch will mark the 100th first mission of NASA's Launch Services bro Program based at Kennedy T Space Center. 15 seconds. Here we go. 10. 9, 8, 7, Sound suppression six, system should be five, turning on right four, around now. 3, 2, Green flash. 1, engine ignition, and the liftoff. All right, we got a lift good lift. Liftoff of SWAT, our first global survey of Earth's surface water to study how this ever-changing resource SWAT is affects in the air. our climate. Blink, it's way too early for that. It's way, it's way too early. And there we get a nice view from the ground camera, and also we switch to the onboard camera. Now, Denton, you didn't go outside to see the <laughs> launch, but now we're feeling it inside here in the Mission Director Center, the rumble all around us from launch. Absolutely. No and now we get a good look at the onboard camera, looking down towards the aft end of the rockets, and you can see the Merlin engines coming to life there. And this room Bumble, coming power, to life, power, really. Yeah. Lots of rumble going on in here. Discovery. And we're soon no going to hear on. that the rocket is supersonic. 242 from Reaper. Thank you very much, buddy. Speed of sound, followed by Falcon 9 reaching what's called Max Q, the moment of peak mechanic stress on the rocket. Falcon 9 set off some nice car alarms. Falcon 9 and supersonic. Yep. Just heard a call off a of supersonic. Getting a good shot of looking at the onboard camera. Back to Q. Maximum dynamic pressure. There's the call. We just stepped through Max Q. Look at these nice UIs here. Next call out back to engine chill. And back engine chill, which means it's getting the second stage engine ready to start. And so, which means we'll be coming up on stage separation shortly, followed by stage two ignition. We see this beautiful shot of all of the uh, Merlin engines, all nine of them uh, lit up. That's, that's Super Luigi. Point seven Merlin much. pounds of thrust. Lots flight. of thrust. Why not SpaceX coverage? Because so NASA thinks they the next call are going to come in quick succession, so we'll walk through them really quick. So at T plus two minutes and 15 seconds, we're going to have main engine cutoff. That's MECO, meaning the nine Merlin engines on the first stage are going to shut down. And then a few seconds after that, stage one and two will separate Stage one will do a flip and do a boost back burn do a to flip. orient itself back towards Earth for that landing here at the uh, Space Force Base. And there we get a good shot of looking at the end of stage. Basically, Nico. the camera is looking up towards okay. the stage separation stage. confirmed. Got a good and call for stage separation. Just, there you go. Stand by for upper stage ignition. Stage one and two separate. Stiff and ignition. Separate. If you see and something pop off right, 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 right about right 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 now, back engine coming to perfect. Life. That's great. You are perfect. seeing first stage, the stage using the attitude control. Do its right. flip. Okay. First stage is using the attitude control thrusters to reorient the stage to point back at the launch site and fire the engines. That plume effect that you're seeing is the first stage engines firing. And the second stage engine, second stage engines firing and actually hitting each other, it creates this really interesting flow phenomenon in the air. The reason why it's kind of moving around all over the place and it looks kind of like water flowing around is because up there where where this is happening, there's not a lot of pressure. They missed the fairing separation, by the way. Uh, there's not a lot of pressure, so gases actually just expand like crazy. So when those when the plume from the first and second stage interact, it leaves it leaves this really cool flow phenomenon effect. They did have fairing separation con uh, confirmed there. They usually do see. In fact, if you go back and look, you could see soot from dip from uh, the past five Merlin One D or Merlin One vacuum uh, or MVAC ignitions. You could see soot all the all on the inside of the interstage. They don't clean it because they don't need to apparently. <laughs> On a scale from 1 to Sentinel-6, how's the coverage been? It's Sentinel-6 tier, Feral. Second stage should burn for more or less another four minutes. Um, stage 1 boost backs burn should have been, should have shut down here. 
T plus four minutes and 10 seconds into the launch of SWAT, and we've had a nominal ascent so far, no issues to report. What material is the nozzle Again, made out of? It's a video of a live. It's proprietary. It's a proprietary composition there, Putre. Uh, I, I, it's probably some aerospace grade metal. I don't know exactly what it's made out of. Uh, like, it could be a bunch of different things. I'm guessing Inconel, but that that is a guess. I, I don't really, I've never really bothered to go and look. Both the Canadian and UK How much weight does the soot add to the rocket? Clearly it's a negligible amount, Cajun, because they don't clean it. I mean, I don't know. It's probably not too much. So the first stage will land vertically. Yep, that's right, Sesh. This thing is going to come back and land literally right next to the launch pad. About, I don't know, 200 meters away from the launch pad, give or take. So about six 600 feet, maybe a little... Actually, it's a little bit more. It's more like 1,000 feet. So 1,000 feet would be, give or take, about 330 meters. It's a, it's a little ways away, but it is the closest landing pad to a launch pad that uh, Falcon 9 uses. Yeah, comparatively to the ones down at the Cape, the ones down at the Cape are not near the pad. They're like four or five miles away from the pad. So if it's like five miles away, we're talking like eight eight kilometers away. It's, th this one is like right next to it. When the thing comes down and lands, you'll be able to see the, the TE in the background in the retracted position. It's actually really cool. Landing burn, right? right? Yeah, they do not try to catch the fairings anymore, Krobe. They waterproofed them. They waterproofed them and moved the positive pressure vents off to the side. And the fairing just goes into the water. That's it. They can steer the fairings down to a area where there's calm seas. And they'll just pull the fairings out. Just, they have this huge net and they just sink the net underneath the fairing and pull the thing right out with a crane and just put it right on the deck. That works a lot better than trying to catch it. So it's not a landing zone and not 39A. Uh, I, it's LZ-4 is the technical name. There's the supersonic retro propulsion. Falcon 9's firing its engine here to basically negate the re-entry heating effects. Now, the entry burn does slow us down. They, they didn't really show much of it. That's good. Uh, the entry burn does slow us down, throw, slow the rocket down a little bit, but it... Uh, it's primarily used as a thermal barrier to push re-entry heating on the first stage away. So that means we should be about one minute, give or take, away from first stage landing. Um, it'd be really nice to see that. We should be getting a nice shot of Falcon 9 flying through the clouds right now in preparation for its landing burn. But, you know, this is good too. Second stage engine, and then we're, uh, for this mission, we're going to have two burns. So you'll stage see one, right. after the stage landing two burn. shuts down, it'll That's, close for a while. And there we then go. We've got a good video of angry talk stage yells one. at clouds. It's about to land. How exciting! Coming in for its uh, landing burn there. Again, the grid fins moving ever so slightly to make sure that it's coming down exactly how they want it to come down. Yep, and you could see the pad coming into view. There it is! Wow, wow. wow. the sonic and booms. And then the sonic booms. Trademark Sonic Booms. Wow. And good touchdown of the stage one. Touchdown. Booster. Perfect. Stage oh. one landing is confirmed. So glad to see that live yep. video. Again, sometimes yes. we don't get it. That was amazing to see. Yes. And feel, really. Yes. <laughs> see and feel. And we get to use this booster again. Yeah. Yeah. Again, six, this, would, this is the sixth flight of this booster. <laughs> this is right. Okay. So we are still awaiting, again, that shutdown <laughs> of, <laughs> of the second, uh, uh, of second, the second stage. stage. Yes. It hurts. And when it does shut down, it's going to be over the Pacific Ocean, just yeah, west of six. the southern tip mm -hmm. of Baja, California. Mm -hmm. Again, exactly where we want it to be following that well. Dude, how, how, how can, how can, how, how is this possible? Can we just have the other guy commentate? The, the the guy that's doing the color commentary is is good. Stage boosted stage touchdown. We get to use it again. I like that guy. That guy's cool. <laughs> Gives us a slag. It's very early in the morning. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Look at the dog leg trajectory that that thing took. Yo, that thing almost launched completely west. You see that? Sweet. Hey, shut. What's going on, man? So we had Seco. Shut down there from that view. And, and this is a view of the spacecraft. 
again. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Uh, so they had second stage engine cutoff, uh, nominal orbital insertion from what I can see from looking at that map view just a second ago. Now, uh, Falcon 9 is going to do a coast. The second stage is going to do a little bit of a coast, and there should be a second engine start here. Um, that's going to be in a little bit, uh, but we'll go all the way to payload deploy and acquisition of signal w uh, with the payload. Yeah, vehicle up. Let's up some Delta V. Yeah, heavy metal. Uh, fortunately, SWAT is not a very heavy satellite. It's, it's 2,000 kilograms. So it's two metric tons, which is 4,400 pounds. That's really not, that sounds like, I mean, 4,400 pounds is pretty heavy. Uh, but that's that's not that's not that bad uh, for a rocket. That's re that's a really small payload, uh, and that's what afforded SpaceX to be able to have the Delta V to do that RTLS. If this satellite was double the mass, you would not be able to do that. Watched a spectacular launch from Vandenberg here in California. Nadia, describe what was going through your mind at that time. What a spectacular, truly spectacular launch. It was a, a, a very bright uh, splash in the sky, and a very loud one too. What an entrance. Uh, welcome uh, to the era of, uh, of SWAT. Uh, very excited. I had some cheering going on oh, here yeah. at the desk. <laughs> yes, and the car went off, yes. Yeah, we had car alarms going Is that really off. how a dog very leg looks though? For our view. Now, I don't soon know, back the alley, SWAT have you ever satellite seen on board will separate from the spacecraft. SWAT stands for no Surface up. Water and Ocean Topography. The satellite will survey nearly all the water on Earth's surface in unprecedented detail. SWAT will provide insights into how the ocean influences. This. So SWAT is using three primary instruments there. They have a they have a nadir altimeter, which is what that ping was in the center that's that's marking the center line. And then they have two interferometers on either side with s synthetic aperture radars. And basically what it does is it, it uses the, the nadir altimeter right there and the two inf interferometers to be able to get a topographical view of the ocean floor and ocean water levels and lake water levels too. It, it basically crosses the interferometers with the, the nadir altimeter, which is that thing at the bottom. It's that like kind of pole shaped thing that's coming out of the bottom of the satellite. The interferometers are here on the left and right sides, and they actually open up, and they, they go to a 10-meter radius on each side. Uh, and once again, it uses those two radars to actually cross. That's why you, you see them kind of pop it off, and it, it looks like the signals are crossing each other. And then that's why you get a track that looks like this, because that's the two interferometers, and then in the center is the nadir altimeter. And it should be able, using those, using the two SAR, the synthetic aperture radars, it should be able to image not only like water levels, but also the ocean floor as well, which is actually really neat. That's, that's pretty, that's a pretty cool piece of kit right there. When's the next launch after SWAT? No, that alleviate, that's in 12 hours. And they, they moved the Starlink mission. We only have one launch today. The Starlink mission got moved to tomorrow. So that's good. There's the two interferometers right there on either side. Yeah, you guys wonder what's underneath all that uh, the uh, gold gold foil that's on these satellites. You wonder it's just literally a metal box. It's like a flying server rack almost in there. It's a server rack with thrusters attached to it, though, and solar panels. It's pretty neat. Uh, that enables discoveries and uh, for the you know for the good of humanity and science. Magic, indeed. We want to show you how some of SWAT's technology works, but to do that, Nadia and I had to go no tap into up. our athletic skills for this one. Take a look. All right, Nadia, in order to learn more about SWAT, we have to play a little basketball. That's right, Raquel. We're trying to explain how the heart of the SWAT mission works, which is a new instrument, a radar interferometer, which we lovingly call Karen. So Karen has two antennas separated by a 10 meter boom. One of the antenna transmits a signal that is bounces back from the Earth's surface and received by two antennas with a little bit delay and out of sync. Now, Karen uses this information 
to compute the distance between the satellite and the Earth's surface and they calculate the water height. So let's see how we can we explain it with the basketball. Okay. You don't mind standing there feet away from me. All right, is right here pretty good? This is perfect. Okay. And we will bounce the ball just like a SWAT uh, satellite bounces a greater pulse between two antennas. Okay. Yep. So what are this we seeing here right now? This is not how you play now? basketball. We're seeing how the ball, which is our radar beam, bounces over the Earth's surface and by knowing the range, the distance, and we compute the height of the water surface. So the ocean isn't a flat surface, there's way. Did you guys like this or did you like it the way I said it? I mean, that might be a little bit biased. So the ocean isn't a flat surface. There's waves. Like, how do you calculate that? That's right. Let's uh, let's bring a box. Okay. So did you notice when the water is a little bit higher that the ball returns to the antenna to us a little bit faster? That's how we know that we're retrieving topography, just like in the name of the mission. Th I like that. that. That's a good way to explain that. Thousands of bounces per second to capture the data on both sides from both antennas over a wide strip on the ground, about 30 miles, 50 kilometers wide. And then once we do enough of those stripes, we'll eventually cover the whole globe. Cool. Nadia, I could really hear your excitement and passion for SWAT in that package. Why are you so excited for this new technology? Yeah, it's a really um, Rocket, that's pivotal funny. moment I think, for our space science industry as we are testing um, new technology with Can't go wrong with, with a Kimbo P90, This is our first in-flight demonstration for the SAR interferometry, and this is opens a new a way of uh, of observing uh, Earth water height. So yes, it is a pivotal moment, and I'm uh, very excited about it. Yes, and like you mentioned before, the scientific heart of SWAT satellite Why is do I the hate KA this so much, band though? radar interferometer, or Karen, and it measures the height of water on Earth. Jasmine is live at the Hawks Nest to learn more about how the technology... Back alley, call me an old fart, and that's fair. I don't, and I know that NASA needs to do the outreach and that it's necessary. I understand. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that I could sit there and do a better job. You know, you know what I mean? Like... I, I really don't like how NASA sometimes talks, does these casts and explains stuff like, like they're explaining it to children. Because I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. Does a child really understand what an interferometer is? A, a kid's gonna, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, seven-year-old is gonna look at that and see a basketball bouncing back and forth and say that's really cool. Like not, not to say that kids are idiots. You know what I mean? Like. It's just a weird way, like, what? why are we, why are we, it's just, that's a very, I always found that that was a very interesting way to do it. I, I don't, I try not to dumb down and reduce, I try to reduce concepts to base ideas, but even then, how I explain things is at the high school level, because if you're a kid and you're in middle school, you don't want it explained to you, like, and you like space, you don't want it explained to you that way. If I'm 15, 16, 17 years old and I want to learn about space, I want to know the real stuff. I want to really know how it works. I don't want to see two people bouncing a basketball back and forth. Does that make sense? So I, I always, the way that NASA does their casts, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to hate. I, I don't think I can do any better. Uh, the way that they explain it, I think, is a little bit off touch. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to go pissing in anybody's cornflakes or anything like that's, if that's the way that works, that's the way that works. There's probably some type of information that I'm missing here. And that's probably the reason why they have to explain it the way that they do. Uh, it's just when I was, and like I said, you can call me out of touch that you'd probably be right. Uh, when I was younger and I wanted to learn about the space shuttle, for instance, I didn't want it explained to me like a five-year-old. I went and sought that information out, the complicated stuff. And now, don't get me wrong, I had no idea what the complicated stuff mean, but that didn't matter because I liked space. I liked space so much. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, Frosted Flake. Yeah, that, that's fair. So, I, I like, don't get me wrong. I do take some of these concepts and make them a little, a little less complicated for people to understand. But I really try not to dumb it down to the point where I feel like I'm patronizing you as a viewer. You know what I mean? The vast majority of us here at three, you know, three, four in the morning or seven in the morning over here are, are not, are like, we're not five. You know what I mean? I guess you're not the target audience, I suppose. Maybe you were smarter than the average kid. I, I don't think so, Solaire. I'm, I'm an idiot. Like... I'm not as bright as I come off. I'm not going to lie to you. Eva, let's get to some questions for you, Nadia. Our f first question is from a young space fan, Mark Andreas. Hello, NASA. My name is Mark Andreas. How we can see water from space? Oh, hi, Mark. Uh, NASA can see different aspects of water from space. We could see how hot is the water, how the temperature, the surface temperature of the water is, how salty is our water, salinity of ocean salinity. We can see uh, how heavy the mass of water, its gravity. Uh, we could, uh, or we can see the volume Mark or the height of, of water with satellites, like SWOT, for example. We could see liquid water, frozen water, like sea ice. We can even see some content of water in the atmosphere. So yeah, so we can see different aspects of water from space. Good question. Yes, yeah, so many different our, ways to see Mark water. And we also have some social media on questions of coming water in. And how they can see that from, from we space. We have, uh, how many times per day will SWAT I'm not saying that Mark's Earth. stupid. I'm saying so that Mark is five. Uh, SWAT phenomenal orbit is Understand? 21 a day repeat orbit. And we have another one coming in for you now. See, how accurate is the equipment when oh, measuring six. the current sea right, level from fine. space? Meters, centimeters, millimeters, nanometers? We're really getting <laughs> into that. That uh, we're, we're, we're targeting centimetric accuracy of uh, sea level measurements uh, from space, which is a, which is a truly breakthrough. It's a 10x improvement of what we are currently that, doing. See, yeah. that's actually now a good question. You're doing such a good that's job answering cool. these questions. We have another one coming in for you. What is ocean topography and how does it work with SWAT? Well, think of it, uh, ocean question. topography, just like uh, mountains and valley, like I was driving here from LAX to, uh, to Lampog, just like mountains and valleys on the ground, you see hills and dips on the ocean surface. So think of it uh, as well. Great explanation. We have another question for you too. Let's get to this one is, will you be able to tell how clean the water is? So we will be able to make some uh, uh, interpretation of water quality and its chemical composition, uh, but but we're mostly focusing on the volume storage I and, guess uh, will, yeah. and, and the height of the water with SWAT. Okay, let's see if we have another one. Yeah, for back you. Ellie. I mean, I, I don't know, man. Will I'm SWAT not going to sit here. Help in I'm not going to sit here and say that. You know. I'm not going to sit here and say that you. You, you know, trying to target a younger audience is, is a bad thing. It's really not. But at the end of the day, if kids want to get involved in space, I, I'm not exactly sure that speaking to them like that is the right move. But then again, I don't have kids, so who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you know, just like any engineering project, there is a very distinct reason why NASA does this the way that they do this. So, who knows? And once again, fellas, I don't mean to be a stick in the mud. The, the rocket launch is awesome. You know, it's really cool. Uh, I, I really I really dig it, but I usually try to let the launches speak for themselves. You know what I mean? But maybe my style is different, you know? Clearly, NASA does, wants to do something different, and that's fine. That's okay. Only collect information on a few thousand rivers and lakes, but with SWAT, it will be more than a million. Here is a look at how that kind of data can have a huge the kids impact switch it off when it sounds too hard. Lives. Yeah, okay, Acid, I got you. SWAT is the Surface nice Water and Ocean Topography Satellite. It's an international satellite that's going to give us this complete view of the surface water here on Earth, what's happening in the lakes, reservoirs, rivers, and also in the ocean. It'll tell us about how sea level is rising along coastlines and in the open ocean and really give us a good understanding of how surface water is, is moving about the earth. Our goal is 
to provide yeah, data, yeah, forecasts, Hence watches, the and warnings. Thing. The basketball thing actually was not a bad. Like that was not a bad river in Portland, which is a major U.S. city that historically has seen some catastrophic floods. The better quality of the data it's that coasting we have right now, he... that feeds into our models, the better the forecasts are going to be. The more time that people will have to protect themselves and their property, and ultimately our so communities. Similar? A tool like SWAT is going to help us with making these really difficult projections and predictions for the future. This is one of many reservoirs here in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. It is a Buffers. human-made lake. It is a reservoir operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. The water managers here, they use you know, weather prediction, they use hydrologic models, and the hope is that data like SWAT might be incorporated into those predictions to help them better understand this water body's filling and we don't want to overtop the dams, might want to start letting water out really quickly. That's they have to make a lot of complicated end. decisions. Yeah, he's good, man. When you get a big storm event, we want to keep the community safe in the best way that we can. So how do we best manage operation of these reservoirs in terms of putting water out downstream to prevent flooding at a larger scale? In lots of states, there are, you know, hundreds, thousands of reservoirs. I mean, Solar, yeah, the bouncing the ball thing wasn't a bad way to explain it, dude. But honestly, you could, you could explain how a synthetic aperture radar works by literally shining a light at a mirror. So, and that's something that everybody has, everybody has a mirror in their house. Take a flashlight, point it at a mirror. What happens? Can you see the, can you see the light bounce back to you? There you go. That's how it works. <laughs> like that, like that's something that the kids that are watching this stream can go and literally do like right now. Certain size remotely you know? for satellites, it really opens up the amount of rivers that we can help understand what happens when they flood or how they flood, and, and that really um, improves our ability to manage our infrastructure and to design new infrastructure. Nice bridge. That is where SWAT will really make a big difference. One of the partners we're working with is the Department of Defense, and they're trying to fill gaps in the data that they have along the coastlines. Our military is obviously very concerned about what's happening on global scales, and they have installations across the globe. So, SWAT will potentially provide an opportunity in to fill in some of those gaps. Ilya, this thing will be a big impact whatever. assessments that they need. Hey, for it's Toro, look at that. Facility. So, LCS trying to understand and give them the information they need to plan for and then potentially adapt to these changes is, is really critically important. Coastal wetlands like the Mississippi River Delta are extremely important because it acts as a buffer between us and the threatening ocean. With SWAT, because of its high spatial resolution, we'll be able to resolve water surface elevation right at the coast. So this is quite important because as sea level rises, the ocean will migrate into the land, bringing more salt into the land. So it Down threatens here. the infrastructure, salt the biodiversity in the wetlands along the coast. Hopefully, the types of models that we're producing can support how they decide to manage the river delta. And SWAT on its own will allow us to upscale these types of studies to the world. I'm really excited about the new information we'll get from SWAT and how we can start to couple it to some of the, the needs that we see, both at the coastal interface and also on land. I think we can potentially see some immediate impact once SWAT's launched in these communities. SWAT is an international collaborative effort, not only between NASA and Kness, but with contributions sure, from the Canadian Space Agency and the UK Space Agency. We'll hear from the UK Space Agency in a moment, but joining us now is Taryn Tomlinson with the Canadian Space Agency. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thanks, thanks for, for having me. Good morning. Now, why did your agency choose to be involved with the SWAT mission? Well, contributing to the first ever satellite to survey most of the water on the planet is truly an exceptional opportunity for us. Water is such an important resource and it is so, in so many ways linked with climate change. And we're so happy to work with our international partners again on solving issues that matter to all of us. SWAT is particularly important to oh, Canada. Look, we have the, the longest shoreline on the planet and we have over a million lakes. And it's so important to monitor the change of those lakes over time. 
Uh, SWAT is really going to benefit Canadians for strategic water management, but it will support humanity in the face of climate change. It really is an international effort, as we say. Sure. Can you talk a little bit more about CSA's contributions to the mission? I'd love to. Uh, CSA will be contributing a key component to the Karen instrument. They're called the Extended Interaction Klystrons, uh, built by CPI Canada. It's the high-powered amplifier that will help those KA band um, precision measurements for yeah, measuring Jim, surface water. <laughs> and so, uh, in addition to the device that we are contributing, we have science researchers who've been involved with the SWAT science team, and they've been developing the objectives, and they're also working to deploy instruments to key sites across they Canada. Yes, Taryn, we enjoy working uh, with, with Canadian scientists and speaking of it, uh, what is the um, Canadian scientists as users are most exciting to use uh, SWOT data for? For the data, so um, we have some oh, services, key services in Canada that we'd really like to improve. And so, as I was mentioning, that shoreline data navigation signal. services to so Canadians we be on is going board to be very important. Weather forecasting is going to be very important as well. Um, should it as be well rotating as like that? Monitors, as I mentioned, the lakes and make sure that we uh, that we uh, keep our eye on on the, the lake measurements. Our researchers are looking towards the north in helping northern communities as well, and so we're talking about clean water supply. SpaceX has a ground tracking station that's down here for, on um, the very southern the coast of uh, Chile. For tides and for estuaries and also hydroelectricity. And I do want to mention, I'm so excited to see what Canadians will do with open science and open data. Excellent. That's yes. the data ahead. And I want to know, what was launch like for you today? Well, it was exhilarating. There seems to be a role component. And excitement outside. That was we were all outdoors. applied to the second what stage was here. specifically exciting for me was to see the return of the booster mm -hmm. and that double sonic boom. And everybody oh, jumped out of the nice to see. <laughs> It was exhilarating. What a morning. Thank you so much. We're grateful to be here. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us today. <laughs> Great early morning. Now, Beth Greenaway with the UK agency wasn't able to be on set with us, but she left this message. The UK Space Agency has contributed to SWAT by enabling both our industry so and our scientists to be part of the mission. We it's were approached by um, the French Space Agency, CNES, who are building the instrument for the mission. They needed a very complex bit of kit built in the UK, which essentially signals or moves the, the radar pulses or around the instrument. Or is it just the rotation instrument. of Earth And it was Honeywell in the UK no, that, that built this. In the UK, we're really fortunate to have some of the world leading no. scientists who understand both the, the oceanography, how the, how the ocean moves, and how satellites Satellites can be used to measure that. It's really exciting to be part of such a big, exciting mission. It takes a long, long time to come through to a launch in 2022. To be part of that journey on the policy side, enabling people to really do the, the best, so the best of wow. British engineering and the best of British science, to be part of such a huge global water survey that's so important for climate change and is really going to make a difference to what we understand about our world. All right, SWAT will measure the Earth's water on a global weather. It will take into account how much fresh water flows in and out of lakes, rivers, and back right, into the ocean. See. It will also look at shifts in sea level. Nadia, you have a demonstration that illustrates the importance of our water that involves a gallon of water That's right here. That's right. We wanted to look a little bit of the water storage, what a budget, what a, what a cycle. And uh, we imagine that all the water uh, on Earth uh, represented in this gallon uh, of, of, of clean water mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how the water moves. So ocean is the ultimate source of all our water. Land does not produce its own water. They didn't take all the label the off of the dish moisture, shelf, uh, so she's covering the label with her hand. Either directly from the ocean or it's subsequently uh, recycled uh, from it. And so some of it um, can't be uh, get back to the ocean, companies, but some of it makes its, its way on land. Some of it is stored in the atmosphere. So if um, if you just do a half a drop okay. uh, of your uh, magic just liquid, that would be representative of how much water is contained in the in, in our atmosphere. So 
Not too much, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Just a little bit. So, yes, and then about a, a tablespoon of that magic liquid, uh, and I'll let you do the math in okay, terms of so how many... That uh, much? Uh, that much would be representative of how much uh, available uh, fresh water we have on land. So about a half a percent uh, only. So also not that much. You know, most of it uh, is uh, contained in our salty ocean. So, so we humans and ecosystem, we depend on this uh, steady supply of water and moisture from ocean to land. And if the ocean supply is interrupted, yep. See, it's all we have a droughts on it. or even fires, like you guys have in California that you experience perhaps yourself. Or if the su Why ocean am I supply invested of water in this? is too much. Uh, we get floods and inundation, just like people like us on the East Coast. So, so this this movement Should and the supply the demand ch chain uh, uh, in in this completeness would be seen by SWOT, just like you and I seeing it in this gallon. Yeah, and what if too much water comes back into the ocean, as you were kind of describing? Yeah, well, then the ocean becomes higher, the volume of the ocean rises. Yeah, <laughs> and how much would it rise? <laughs> Well, currently we are observing about uh, three millimeter, three point four millimeter of global mean sea level yes, rise. Yes, Mal, I don't yeah. know if, if that makes sense. So, in in gallons, that would be about uh, three hundred trillion of uh, gallons a year. That's how much water we add uh, every year into the ocean. Just zoom the camera okay, so I, that I can't see the bottle. Giant number. How how can you help put that to Visualize? scale? Visualize. Well, yes. I mean, I guess if you uh, line up uh, all these <laughs> jars, uh, you would cover. <laughs> Uh, the distance from a sun to Pluto and back. So yeah, it's a lot of water. The sun to Pluto yeah. and back. Yes, <laughs> a lot of water. That's a lot of water. Well, Cover thank it again. you so yep. much, Nadia, for this. Stop. Now, uh, a SWAT technology tracks changes in water volume over time, like you mentioned, oh. and we will get a better understanding of Earth's water cycle. That data can be used to help prepare communities for rising seas and changing coastlines. Let's learn more about Earth's water. Earth has about 370 quintillion gallons of water. If all that water was inside a single drop, it'd be 860 miles wide. Of course, it's not. Earth's water can be found all over the planet. Read the label. Write that down. Write that water down. Tells us where that water is and what form it takes. You know, this makes me feel better. NASA <laughs> has a fleet of satellites studying the location and movement of Earth's water. Each designed to measure Alex, that's pretty good, man. Water. Some measure the movement of groundwater or ocean currents, while new missions like SWAT and NISAR will also fill gaps in our knowledge by measuring fresh water and possible hazards. Together, these missions help bring NASA's water budget and cycle into focus. So next time you feel a drop of rain on your face, imagine all the places that water might have been during the last few billion years and where it might be in the next. On Earth. You know, that video really shows off NASA's family fleet, doesn't it? That's right, yes. Yes, and let's jump back into questions from kids. Oh, and the bottle's media. gone. Where'd it go? And, you know, speaking of family, looks like we have a special surprise for you, Nadia. Ooh, okay. Hi, NASA. My name is Kira. I'm 80 years old. I'm in Washington, D.C. I heard that sea levels are rising. What I want to know is if me and all puppies are safe. Kira, out. Did we just see there, Nadia? <laughs> well, hi, Kira. Yeah, this is this is this is Kira, uh, my daughter. So I hope that your parents will keep you safe and your puppies as well. But uh, when you grow up uh, by you know 2050, I think uh, sea level I believe would be about half a meter high in Washington D.C., which is about uh, uh, 20 inches of extra water where you live, and so that would be your job. Uh, to, to keep your puppies uh, 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 safe. Half meters, and actually, not uh, Raquel, uh, NASA has None. a very uh, useful tool where we could uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the um, and predict uh, sea enough. level rise 10, 20, 50, even 100 years from now. Uh, not just for here in Washington, D.C., but uh, all uh, uh, all uh, major coastal city all over the globe. And I see that we have, uh, oh, yeah. yes, uh, well done, NASA, yeah, sea level that NASA that go. Very, very effective. Yeah, we have a link. Sealevel.nasa.gov. Mm -hmm. And we have some social questions coming in for you as well. Let's see the first one coming up here. Oh, actually, we have a photo. This one is a oh. picture. We have a space fan. 
Let's take a look at Watson. Oh, look at little Watson there. So cute. His mom, Lucy, says he has been a fan since birth. <laughs> wow, this is not far, 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 far along, right? <laughs> Great, that was a very cute very picture. Cute. Now we have a social question to get to for okay. you. Okay. Let's see. The first one coming up is, can you shortly describe the collaboration between Kness and NASA on the SWAT mission? Who does what? Who does what? Uh, yeah, so, so NASA and CNES have been long-standing partners, uh, working with CNES uh, uh, for more than 30 years, uh, especially for the satellite altimetry. Uh, this has been the relationship that we've been doing very strongly, going on into fourth decade. It, and, and when we talk about collaboration, it was a truly collaborative effort when we were uh, doing both uh, testing and engineering and ping-ponging our uh, SWAT observatory back I between know, JPL Shaw. and TALIS. Uh, in France uh, multiple times, so, so both agencies contribute, uh, contributed major hardware instrumentation for the observatory. And the questions just keep coming in. We have another social question for you to answer. Take a look. This one is, how long will SWAT be in space? A good question. The so the nominal uh, uh, mission uh, timeline is three years. So we give our engineers a reasonable uh, t uh, timeline to fulfill engineering objectives. But uh, longer than that would be a very welcome uh, bonus uh, for our scientists uh, to use SWOT data beyond those three years. That's a great bonus. Uh, let's get to the next social question. How is the data shared? Which institutions are the intermediaries and which are the end users? I will soon be working with the French government to study link between water management and spatial infrastructure. It's an exciting subject. Well, thank you. We, we, we think so too. So this is a free for all. All data would be available to the public mm -hmm. uh, through NASA and the CNES uh, uh, data providers. Uh, and, and not just that, we're actually welcoming a community to help uh, NASA and CNES uh, validate the data prior to the delivery of a fully validated data set. This is the experiment that Sandra mentioned uh, that we're going through at NASA. It's called Open Science and we are delivering and sharing pre-validated data sets with the science community. So all hands on deck, if you want to be a hydrologist or work uh, with infrastructure as this uh, uh, person who asked this question, uh, welcome. Yes, data for all. Thank you so much, Nadia. We still have time to get your questions answered. Simply post your question online with the hashtag tracking world and water. Now we are just over 41 minutes since launch. Commentators Megan Cruz and Denton Gibson are tracking the next milestones on this mission. Yeah, hello again, guys, from inside the Mission Director Center here at Vandenberg Space Force Base in Central California. We're actually sitting right next to where Nadia and Raquel are, because this is where we can listen in to the teams mm -hmm. uh, who are still working the launch. So okay. uh, it's They're been about 41 minutes uh, since liftoff from Vandenberg Space so, Force Base. We had a CB, nominal ascent, and now... See this here? This, what they're doing is they're thermally conditioning the second stage motor. The M Merlin vacuum here, or MVAC for short, they're doing a thermal conditioning on the engine, and they still have, they seem to still have an acquisition of signal through, through Chile there. Um, basically what they're doing is that motor's been sitting in the sun for about 45 minutes, and what they need to do now is they need to get the cold propellants flowing through the turbine machinery, which is behind this thermal blanket here. Uh, so they'll start, they'll start trickling a little bit of water in there using, using the pressure from the stage. I said water, it's liquid oxygen. They'll start trickling a little bit of liquid oxygen in there, which is cryogenic, it's really, really, really cold, uh, to get the engine basically primed and ready to fire. You don't want to try to take the really, really cold propellant and put it in a really, really hot engine uh, because it can damage the engine. You don't want to do that. So that's what, that's this, this accumulation here is them venting down uh, and thermally conditioning the engine for a uh, second engine start here. Engine will start up again, and then um, shortly after that, uh, stage, um, excuse me, spacecraft separation will occur. And what ground station are we trying to hit? So the ground yeah, station no that, um, that we're, hey, we're kind of targeting right now is uh, hard to be stuck, which is on the south end of of the Af african continent in south africa so that's the ground station we want to get in range we want to kind of capture that 
that uh, stage, excuse me, that spacecraft separation. You saw Soyuz doing and that so again, recently. We are oh, there's engine ignition. This we have SES2. To get it to. Yep. All right, and we see the engine lighting now. Again, the second burn of the second stage. Okay, there was a quick insertion burn, 9. establishing the orbital Still apogee at 850 swap. kilometers. Be a very short 550 burn. miles. And we already have a uh, nominal deploy orbit. Engine shut down. And we just heard a call out that we are in the nominal orbit, so which means we are kind of in, um, on the correct path to go to state, I'm just kidding, spacecraft separation. I, I do just love that we see all this live video, and we are going to, uh, we expect to get some live video of spacecraft separation again in just less than 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, you want us yeah. to stick around for that? But for now, we're send yeah, it back the launch to was about an hour ago, actually about 45 minutes ago, give or take. Thank you, Megan and Denton. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory led the U.S. portion of this international mission. JPL's director, Lori Leshen, joins us now. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you both. Uh, what a fabulous job you're doing. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Well, this is your first launch as the director for JPL. Yes. How excited are you for this mission? Oh, I'm thrilled. I mean, first of all, it's just been an extraordinary day here getting to be on console and then run outside and, and actually watch the launch, which was great, and hear those sonic booms when the booster came back. Our launch teams have been incredible, but I'm just so thrilled for the SWAT team. Why are they barely showing anything? Um, so, Alleviate, uh, I don't mean to interrupt Lori here, uh, uh, Alleviate, they're not showing anything because NASA, because SpaceX doesn't have a track through certain ground stations. They had a loss of signal as it flew over Antarctica. But <clears throat> whoever's directing this cast seems to think that that's just a reason to talk about the rocket and not actually show telemetry or anything. That's another thing that I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, uh, there we go. See, we had a reacquisition of signal there. Um, the split box is the right way to do this. Of SWAT, we now have 15 Earth science missions currently operating, either dedicated missions or uh, big instruments on, on other missions. So we've got a lot of eyes on Earth at JPL. How much water is and the thing put in about them is, whenever water. we do something at JPL, we want so, it to be technologically advanced. So we're always. What they're doing here now is they're purging out the engine with helium because you don't want to leave the liquid oxygen and potentially gaseous oxygen inside of the inside of the inside of the engine one it's it makes things super flammable two um i don't i don't really have a, a basketball analogy or something for this um liquid oxygen oxidizes things oxidization is rust rust is really bad for things that are made out of metal because it either corrodes or oxidizes and rusts it uh even corrosion is still oxidizing things. Like if you have aluminum and you, you know it gets introduced to oxygen, it's going Discovery. to corrode and form aluminum oxide. That's not good. So what they're doing is through those same vent lines, they're actually purging out. They're, they're basically pumping out all that gaseous oxygen out of that vent line by shooting helium into the engine uh, to basically inert the engine and get it dried out to make sure that it doesn't rust. Now, why, why, do, why don't you want the inside of the engine to rust? Well, SpaceX has to be a good environmental steward here, and just and why does it matter now that they're on the deployment orbit, right? Well, they need to be a good space environmental steward and deorbit the stage, so they do have another engine firing from that stage to get the stage back down and get it away from any any debris or anything. Celtic, 25 months. That will we won't see that. That'll happen much after much long after SWAT is deployed here but on the scale of SWAT is a mission called NISAR which is a collaboration NASA's first major collaboration with the Indian Space Agency why is it going to deorbit so, anyway so exciting you don't and want to leave SWAT unguided debris up there water, dead scum NISAR is focused so the second stage doesn't it has batteries on it but it doesn't have any power generation systems there's no solar panels on that thing there's no fuel cells on it so once the batteries run out it's pretty much junk it's just floating orbital debris. And part of being a good space environmental steward is making sure that you don't leave unguided debris up there, especially something as big as a semi-truck. That second stage is huge. It's a very, very large upper stage. Actually, maybe a semi-truck trailer. They move them on semi-truck trailers, if that makes any sense. It's a pretty big upper stage. You, you don't want to leave that unguided floating around. It could hit something. It could come back down on an unguided re-entry over a populated area which some other space programs really, really 
seem to insist on doing, which is really messed up. Uh, but yeah, you, you, so when I say being a good space environmental steward, I'm talking about not clogging space up with crap because you can have stuff like if you've ever seen the movie Gravity, Gravity, albeit a little bit unrealistic, illustrates a concept called Kessler syndrome. Uh, basically where one satellite hits another satellite and that makes a debris cloud and that debris cloud is like a shotgun blast and that hits two more satellites and that hits two more satellites and it causes a cascading effect that basically just clogs up low earth orbit with a bunch of unguided debris. That is a very real phenomenon and that absolutely can happen. And then no one can launch into space without getting literally hit by a piece of debris on the way up. You don't want to do stuff like that. That's really stupid. It's part of the reason why space remains so peaceful, because everybody wants to retain the capability to be able to launch stuff into space. They do deorbit Baden, but they put the second stage on a trajectory that's going to make it burn up. So no piece they put it on a um, on a very steep re-entry trajectory, so no pieces will survive. Nothing will make it down to the surface from that thing. Maybe sometimes the COPV does from time to time. But also, part of being a good space environmental steward is making sure you do that in an unpopulated, non-shipping, non-ocean shipping lane part of the ocean. The South Pacific is usually where that happens. They purposefully deorbit a bunch of things down in the South Pacific. So we're talking like a couple thousand miles south of Hawaii, because there's no major shipping lanes down there. Uh, and, you know, if stuff does get down to the surface, it's just going to go to the bottom of the ocean. And that's that. And most of the stuff is inerted anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. But yeah, everything is in the South Pacific. South Pacific. They call that the they call that space graveyard for a reason. That's where Mir, the remains of Mir, is. That's the the Russian, the Soviet and Russian space station. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, all all manner of second stage second stages are deorbited over the South Pacific. They do that on purpose. So we used a lot of really good teamwork and collaboration. Well, that's part of ITAR passing. Agency and not just Kennedy Space Center and JPL, but we leveraged our resources up at Goddard Space Flight Center, who has done some of these conversions before. And it's just the type of community and, and teamwork that our niche little area of analysis has uh, grown over the years. Dave, Pierre, thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, Well, oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Back to you. We are nearing spacecraft separation. Let's go back to our commentators, Megan and Denton. Yeah, we're about 51 minutes after launch, and now we are awaiting spacecraft separation. So SWAT, the spacecraft separating from Falcon 9's second stage. Yes, and, and that'll occur as we get closer to the Harder Begins to Talk Station. You don't need to make now an analogy we'll for spacecraft video separation. Of the SWAT spacecraft looking up, and then there's another cycling through of the MVAC engine. So, yeah, once we get to the point where we uh, separation occur, hopefully we'll get a good video of that. And now there's a slight chance we may get um, acquisition of signal from the spacecraft at that point in time, but that's not the primary opportunity to get it. Sure. So you see the telemetry data right there, stage two, just at Can the Den tip of uh, us, South please? Africa. You were mentioning a ground station there. Mm -hmm. It's because when... Um, when the spacecraft separates from the Falcon 9 second stage, we want to make sure we know where it is, yes. and we do that by using the ground station, Correct. right? Yeah, and the ground station is what is capturing the video that you're seeing here, as well as the telemetry coming from the vehicle. So that's how the, the team down on the ground is able to, to see everything in the, uh, that's happening in the data and actually get the video as well. So you see the SWAT spacecraft there. SWAT stands for Surface Water and Ocean Topography and is a joint mission by NASA and Kness, France's space agency. Uh, they had contributions from both the Canadian and UK space agencies. Yep, and once separation occurs... SWAT payload, separation confirmed. All right, and we got a call from the... Video. Uh, and we're hearing some cheering here at the Mission Payload Director Specialist Center Mission at Control, Vandenberg Space Force Base. I'm sure the SWAT. spacecraft team uh, for Kness is also cheering in their mission control center. You see the spacecraft floating away right now from the second stage. And at this point, the launch vehicle's uh, job is done. So the second stage will just basically kind of back off, move away from the, the spacecraft and kind of take itself out of, out of orbit. Just so we don't... So SWAT surface water and oceanographic to topography satellite, it, it monitors sea levels, Rooster? 
And it actually uses a really awesome system. Th those two long rectangular things on it actually end up deploying out like wings almost. Uh, and they're the those things are out on the ends like this. It's, it's going to do a jazz hands for you. Um, see, that was uh, that was ironic cringe. I'm like, I'm I'm ironic. Anyway, um, so basically, on the bottom of the satellite there is a Nadir a Nader radar radar altimeter, and basically that radar altimeter is bouncing a signal to be able to see the altitude of the satellite localized to the terrain, right? And then the two infer interferometers that are on the outside are actually pointed kind of inward, so they actually cross, and they cross where the radar altimeter, they cross the signal, the radar altimeter, and then the two synthetic aperture radars uh, combined with the cross can actually interpolate sea level data and get you a good representation of water levels. It's pretty damn cool, actually. Uh, that's a, that's a pretty interesting way to do that. They're using converging synthetic aperture radars combined with a standard radar altimeter to be able to interpolate terrain data, which is actually, that, that's really cool. That is a really, really cool way to do that. You can see that's SWAT right there on the side. See the interferometers are out on the outsides there. And then the, there's a downward facing radar right there. That's, that's the, that's the radar altimeter. Um, it's actually, it's really interesting. Um, very interesting way to do that. I, I, I really appreciate the tech there. I'm hoping so. Yeah, the first full pass uh, for ask signal on, Sesh. is slated for T plus one hour and 18 minutes. You did mention that we might get some initial data around this time, yeah. but really what the team is uh, marching towards is that one hour 18 minutes, that's when we really want to confirm signal, meaning that the spacecraft is healthy and it's mm -hmm. where we want it to be. Yeah, and that's an important step in this whole process is, uh, you know, after the, the ride, it's kind of, you know, like you ride on a roller coaster and, you know, you want to make sure after you get off, you got all your belongings, everything's looking good. And that's essentially what it is where we wait to kind of hear um, confirmation that the team in France is able to communicate to the satellite, make sure everything's good um, and everything went well with the ride. Okay, so we got a couple of minutes to wait for uh, that acquisition of signal. So until then, we'll send it back to Raquel and Nadia. They should have an acquisition of signal here through Diego Garcia, but we're not going to see that because people talk. Question, and her name is Micaela. Hello, my name is Micaela, and I have two questions for you today. One is, how long will this mission take? And number two is what is the range of accuracy with this technology? Thank you. Some great questions there. Yes, Micaela looks like a future engineer with a very smart question. So, Micaela, we uh, the prime uh, mission timeline is uh, three years, and uh, our uh, targeted accuracy for ocean heights is uh, about a centimeter accuracy mm -hmm. for smaller features, you know, less than 1,000 kilometers. And for larger features, which we're going to use our other non-carrying altimeter, we're shooting about uh, 3 centimeter accuracy. And about 10 uh, centimeters. That's a good question. I don't actually don't have a problem with that. Michaela. That was cool. That's an engineering career in her future. Yep. <laughs> uh, we also have smart questions for smart kids. Sweet. To. Let's take a look at the first one. When will SWAT data be publicly released? We we would have a first uh, look at at the data about uh, full no, nominally full 2023. This is where we are inviting our science community Raquel to help uh, NASA to to validate Sam, I don't know if you saw uh, and the take a first stuff, look at the, the data. We call was... it a pre-validated data set. Mm -hmm. So don't write your nature papers yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, but fully validated. Um, data I expect it to be around the spring time frame 2024. Okay and we have another question Where, and I think it's more about media. the ocean levels here. Uh, Alessandra asks what will be the probes data processing centers? So the major processing data would be our French uh, 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 partners and then data would be downlinked to GPL and back so was, this is was, again a team bad. effort. Yeah showing off that international dude, collaboration. Was, it, come on, Sammy. Yeah, I mean, dude, like, it, this is my chat, dude. I try to, you know, I try to curb Will that stuff, but sometimes I'm just like... What resolution? 
Three centimeters, but it can only look at rivers wider than 100 meters wide, the discrepancy. And they are also excited to see some and discover thousands of new mountains on the bottom of our Maybe because of the convergence angle of the interferometers. It can't capture something smaller than the convergence distances. Is there water in the atmosphere of Earth? That's my guess. there is on all the surface of oceans on Earth? What amount if subterranean water is unknown currently? They're really asking you tough questions. Yes, and I think the maybe they just was excited with our demonstration. So most of the water is, of course, located in the ocean. We just saw it in this hour gallon. And the only tiny uh, portion of the Earth's um, global water cycle is contained by the atmosphere. So atmosphere cannot hold a lot of moisture, and uh, but it's very effective uh, at transporting uh, uh, water between the, the ocean and land. Great, thank you, Nadia. Now, if you have a question to ask, post your question online with the hashtag tracking world water. You did a great job answering those. Schwab will create <laughs> the first comprehensive global survey of freshwater lakes, rivers, and reservoirs from space. Let's go to Jasmine live at the Hawk's Nest, who is with a scientist eager to use the new data. Thanks, Raquel. Yes, joining me now is Tamlin Pavelski, the SWAT hydrology science lead. Thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. We are so excited, especially after seeing that spectacular launch, Tamlin. And right now, scientists really have to trek into the field to understand the data from <laughs> yeah, rivers nice. and lakes. Tell me, how is SWAT going to change that? Oh my gosh, it's going to change it so much. So, uh, you know, right now, if I go into the field uh, for a field campaign, I might be able to go and measure a couple of rivers, a few dozen lakes. SWAT is going to be able to see lakes all over the world in places I can't even get to where it's just impossible. And so the kind of science that, that, that we're going to be able to do with SWAT is just orders of magnitude above what we can do with uh, just data on the ground. That said, even more powerful is going to be combining the kinds of measurements we can make on the ground with the groundbreaking measurements we'll make with SWAT. Exactly, so we're combining kind of the methods that we've already used with some new things from Exactly. SWAT. That is so exciting. And what are you most excited, what measurements are you most looking forward to from SWAT? So I think I might be most looking forward to SWAT's measurements of lakes. So we're gonna be able to measure simultaneously the water level in lakes and the area of lakes. We'll be able to see changes in volume. And we're not just gonna be able to see that in a few lakes, right? Right now, maybe we can see Look a few tens of thousands of, of lakes using on the ground data. With SWAT, we're going to see millions. So it's like going to a more powerful oh, telescope where suddenly all these new control. stars appear. All right. right, and when you say that figure millions, I mean, that's so hard to even picture, but it's really, really exciting. And how is SWAT going to help us understand how water moves worldwide? I mean, this is a global view. Yeah, so I think a lot of us start learning about the water cycle really early on, you know, in elementary school or middle school, maybe. and. Uh, you know, that's because it's so fundamental to how our planet works and water is a precious resource for us. And SWAT Chance. is going to tell us about one of the most critical parts of the water cycle, which is surface water, right? So we have evaporation right off of the ocean and off the land. We have precipitation coming down. SWAT is going to help us put real numbers on how the amount of water flowing through rivers is changing over time and how climate change is affecting that. Right. That is that is so exciting to see how this is all working together. Tamlin, thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Awesome. Raquel, back to you. Thank you. SWAT is going to measure how much water is on Earth, but also how it moves. We actually don't know the extent of some of the science that this is going to produce. That's and right. I'd like to introduce you to Christine Gabara. She's a mechanical engineer inspiring future generations. Coming to work every day, it's always really nice to know that the system that we're building will collect science data that will be spread publicly, that the data will help people. Hi, my name is Christine Jabara, and I'm an integration test engineer at JPL. SWAT is an Earth orbiting satellite. It stands for Surface Water Ocean Topography, and it'll give us more accurate data on how the water levels, the fresh water and the salt water levels, are changing. With time. See the convergence distance, dude? The day to day varies when they, a lot. When the, We're when the radars cross each other with the, testing, um, the radar altimeter, the I think that's why they can't image. The coolest parts of SWAT to me are the, like the engineering bits that are slightly extreme. 
So I've really enjoyed working on the deployable antennas. It's nerve wracking. But oh, it's a cool. Well Look at that. Rehearsed dance. And when the antennas actually deploy, they're really beautiful. They're moving slowly and intentionally. Cool. Like a butterfly. Now, see, this part's, this part's legit, Texas. dude. That's cool. I was very lucky to be part of the Girl Scout sailing program where they taught us not only how to sail, but they taught us the very basics of aerodynamics and how the sailboat worked. I became an aerospace engineer because of that program. The ability to say, oh, I know how this works, and then going to implement it in like a way that was fun and exciting was really rewarding. Word. If I were to tell a little girl how to get into engineering, I would tell her just to get started in whatever way feels exciting and natural. It gets a lot easier once you just get started and start tinkering with things and building whatever excites you. It's not lost on me at all that I grew up sailing and I still love the water and the, the spacecraft a, that we're building she got a warm logo. Us track our oceans and our lakes and our Worm, warm logo code. Hopefully we'll be able to sail for much, much longer in beautiful blue waters. SWAT is a joint mission between NASA and Kness with contributions from the Canadian and UK space agencies. Joining us now is Caroline Laurent, the Director of Orbital Systems and Applications at Kness. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Caroline. <laughs> uh, what does it mean to finally see the satellite in space? Well, it's, it's so great. It's such Painting. an experience. What I'd like to say is I'm so proud of everybody. I'm proud of I'm proud of the French teams, of course, of my teams from Kness and Thales Alinea Space, but I'm also so proud of our collaboration. And of course, this success is due to our common teams and to NASA, GPL, and SpaceX. I want to congratulate Good everybody memory. for no this incredible launch. Thanks for the seven, man. And I w I'd like to say I'm really proud to see what international cooperation can achieve together for the common good, so it's a great day. Yes, and there's yes, lots Jen. of activity still happening <laughs> yes. here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Uh, what is happening over at Kness in the main control center at France right at this moment? Okay, so uh, in Toulouse we have the main control <coughs> center and we have Excuse ground me. stations all of the, over the world. So it looks like there's the a separate road to space cast. Uh, maneuver for an hour and a half and we'll have the solar panels, which is the main important thing happening, uh, which will uh, be deployed. But then uh, the, they will take fully control of the satellite uh, in one hour and a half, probably from uh, Sweden or South Africa. And during that hour and a half, although, although the satellite is on an automatic mission, it will go, send Rasmiel. information to, so the people can start having them, and so there are people. It's live coverage be, uh, of the launch, Jay, uh, but you wouldn't know. Twenty-four hours a day working, like showing everything starting from the now rocket. through Christmas, and everybody. I want to congratulate them, of course. Mm -hmm. And then they will start receiving. They will start deploying the antennas in a few days, and uh, when, once it's fully in orbit, they will start put the switching on the payload, and start receiving. Then there will the calibration That's, and validation that is a will Panther. start. And then they will start receiving all the data, and they will in the end get eight Dude, I have this of thing. data everywhere. That uh, I have this thing about casts, about casting rocket launches. I have this thing. You know what that thing is? Showing the rocket. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand if the rocket is between ground stations, you're not going to be able to do that. You can't show live feeds of the rocket when you don't have a signal to it. However, we could see a ground track here. There could be something show us where the rocket is relative to the trains, any telemetry, stuff like that. I mean, you're not going to get to, you'll get baked telemetry at this point because you don't have a signal, right? But, it, oh my God. And uh, of course, SWAT is a new, is a breakthrough because now we're going to monitor water. And uh, before that, we were only uh, surveying the oceans. So that's a major breakthrough. And that uh, to, mon to monitor globally all over the world, the water is really important for uh, our world for the next decades. And as I said at the beginning, I mean, it's an incredible collab collaboration. We have also Canadian and uh, and British uh, friends working with us together. And it's good to see what we can achieve together. And uh, it's such an incredible collaboration. So right now, 
I'm expecting uh, us to uh, exploit the SWOT and to, uh, to have a lot of years of uh, tremendous data with SPOT. What? But I'd like to think <laughs> already of you. Hey, we got the rocket! Because it's been... Hey! Thank you, Caroline. Caroline, yes. thank you for joining us. Oh. Well, the SWAT satellite can see rivers that are wider than 330 feet, and that's about the length of a soccer field. Cedric David, a hydrologist who studies the world's rivers, shared his unique connection to water. Please, please just... There is something about the environment that's just incredibly cool. A lot of what we do as, as scientists is we're just curious. And so anybody who's a curious person ought to be a scientist, in my opinion. You can think of the world's rivers as Earth's <sighs> arteries because they're essential to life. I'm Cedric David, and I study the world's rivers. Word. SWAT is a mission that is specifically designed in part to observe rivers, and it's also being designed jointly by NASA and the French Space. So, I don't really mean to undermine like what SWAT is doing. It's an important and crucial piece of scientific instrumentation that we need to understand why the Earth is doing what it's doing, right? However, I I'm very interested in how many ways NASA can tell us exactly what I just said. picture of surface waters from space. Like, this, I think we're on the, the will be a scientific sixth or seventh way of them going saying to have a big impact on water what SWAT does. It, like, I like to say that water is my 20 friend. different forms. Uh, water is my happy place. I was born with a physical disability that affected Thanks, both of my legs. Yeah. Being able to walk now was not a done deal at birth and it still involves a significant amount of discomfort and is a constant reminder of having been born different. For as long as I can remember, water has been the only place where I felt comfortable, where I felt normal, where I felt like I could do things like everybody else. But when I get in the, in the water, it's just like, I mean, you're floating. When you're floating, it's just like all the pain goes away. As a kid, my parents would take my brother and I all the time to jump in the Mediterranean. Uh, I, I, but to I this day, we still do it on New Year's Day every year. Cool. Planning like for future this generations cool. requires us understanding how much water we have. And a SWAT will be able to provide that global view of the world's fresh waters. Yeah, in my opinion, it might very well become the key that unlocks surface water observations around the world and unleashes surface water management. So it might help us make sure that everybody gets access to fresh water. Now more than ever, it's important to recognize that water connects us all and it might be the one thing that unites us all. We have some more oh, questions to answer. Again. And before we get to the social media questions, we have one from Easton. Hello, my name is Easton. I'm six years old and I'm from Twain, Indiana. And I have a question for you. Can you see swap from our planet? That's a good question, Easton. Well, um, SWAT uh, is relatively small compared to other uh, celestial bodies, um, and it's not as bright as, say, uh, Moon. A um, kid. It's about 500 miles above the Earth's surface. But maybe um, with a pair of good binoculars, uh, yep. far away from major cities on a particularly night sky, uh, you can spot SWAT from, uh, from Indiana, where you live. And some binoculars there. We also have social media questions coming in, so let's get to the first one. Let's see, Elaine, will SWAT measure ice fields, glaciers, and snowpack, or just liquid water? It's a good question. So the, the primary focus for SWAT is is uh, ice-free uh, water, um, but we do have uh, a couple of scientists who are interested uh, to use uh, SWAT measurements uh, for, for the height of sea ice as well. Good question. Yeah, let's get to the next one. What will happen to the probe after the mission? So I presume it's a, um, the care in instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, it yes. will stay on the satellite and do its job until until <laughs> until we're done. <laughs> OK, 
keep going. All right, we have another How question coming up. How could that possibly have been? Hi everyone at NASA. SWAT our bodies no one are seventy percent water, no one and then we cremate Shut the deceased. Does that water go into the atmosphere and then the land and the sea? They're really getting into details, or get rained back onto land. Also, is the SWAT mission measuring the depth of water to calculate the volume? Mm -hmm. So we could calculate uh, the volume uh, by knowing the slope of the water and its height. Mm -hmm. So that's. Uh, that, that, that's one of the measurements that we're targeting and knowing the volume and, and height is really um, a very dynamic variable, Raquel. It can also tell us uh, how the water moves mm -hmm. and how it moves different quantities with that, you know, quantities like heat or energy or plastic or pollution. So it, it's, it's a very dynamic and rich quantity to deal with. Lots of variables. Yep. Next question. How will SWAT satellite help in our fight against climate change? In many ways. Uh, let me start with the oceans. Uh, you know, ocean is known to absorb most of the global warming that we've accumulated over the past few years. And as we expect, uh, ocean continue taking it for the team. <coughs> Excuse me, Team Earth. What, what's really interesting question, uh, Raquel, is would it continue to absorb heat or we reach the steeping point when the efficiency of the of the earth oceans is decreasing and all of this heat will be uh, kicked back so by observing uh, a range of energetics we sword like on a range of frequencies will really answer this one of the most critical questions of our time of what happens with our planet as we as uh, as it warms as well as with our water resources that are impacted by the climate change questions like will population will have enough water to survive or maybe it will have too much water that will impact its livelihood on land. So a range of questions we are looking to it's answer. Funny, with SWAT People mission. come in here. Truly critical questions. Truly really well. critical. Yes. Italian, French. Thank you, Nadia, and thank Portuguese. you for all your questions today. I think I don't we are about them. one hour after launch. Really Commentators funny, Megan and Denton are with us again. I bet they're really confused. Yeah, back here at the Mission Director Center, where you can actually see some people behind us celebrating, um, because again, the spacecraft separated a little bit ago, and now we are awaiting acquisition of signal with the spacecraft. But I do want to point out that uh, a few minutes ago, the spacecraft team did confirm that they did get initial data from the spacecraft already, right? right? Oh, well. Yeah, and and the and we, as we mentioned, there was a chance that me. shortly after separation, we could get some data, and. They did confirm they did receive some telemetry, and it's just a subset of the in the full suite of telemetry that we'll we expect to get here in a, in a couple of minutes. So it's just a, it was just a small subset, just in the, uh, just to confirm they could communicate with the spacecraft, which is then great, we should call launches. The spacecraft guy, is doing the, well. Okay, that guy, so yes, the guy that was just that talking. Full uh, acquisition of signal in the, the, let in that man commentate minutes. on launches. Um, so when we get that full acquisition of signal, what kind of data are we talking about? Yeah, and so it's the full suite of data. It's the the you know the spacecraft reporting. Okay, we. our instruments are looking good. Um, all, all the subsystems are working correctly, and that's the type of data we're expecting to get from um, during this uh, initial pass, excuse me, I say this primary pass here in a couple of minutes, and just to make sure that everything's working correctly and you know they did well during the ride mm -hmm. and, and you did mention the instruments obviously there's a number of different instruments on the SWAT spacecraft so you will get data about each of the instruments as well yes and they'll be able to confirm all, all that I all is working well and that's what we expect to see and that's one of the, the the keys of this whole mission is to make sure hey I look like part of the team everything that's on board of, of the spacecraft is working well because we we really wanted to ex be able to execute their mission which as you know we've, we've heard throughout the night there. how see? critical this mission is Okay. This guy again, is sitting at my um, desk. We are, or the team is targeting T plus one hour and 18 minutes. Uh, Get away from my desk, seconds, so about a minute from now. That That is what they're targeting for acquisition of signal. But but really, that milestone isn't as hard so, as right. other milestones, right? Yeah. I, and sitting it's, in the guy's lab? Well, he's sitting really, at my desk, Cammy. What you know, do you want? Where the spacecraft is, you know, how the, the launch was, and, and also impacted by atmospheric conditions. Because if you think about, you know, like when you shine in a, a, a flashlight on something and you would have like this cone and basically oh, the ground station is essentially looking up um to the to the sky and and looking at 
where this so r- roundabout where the spacecraft is. So when it come when spacecraft comes into range, that's when we'll actually start to get data and be able to communicate to it. So See? it's not exact and because again, when there is a target. Clear, mm-hmm. so, succinct, you know, it may be off perfect. A few seconds drives the there, point home but, with like you know, three we're sentences. expecting to get good confirmation of that coming up soon. Done. Okay. And that ground station, we're hitting one in uh, Karuna, Sweden, right? That's the ground station Correct. we're hoping to make yes. connection with. Yes, and that's the ground station that the the spacecraft is is on its way towards right now. And Those so are nice hopefully ones, here in a sure few on seconds we should hear confirmation that the team was able to get that full um, suite of information from the spacecraft. And I do want to talk a little bit about the second stage. So obviously it's separated from mm-hmm. the spacecraft. The second stage is still out there in orbit, but there's going to be a burn later. Mm-hmm. That is correct. Yes. So, you know, there's a lot of junk floating around space and that's a big problem Corona that, Sweden, know, um, them, the, yeah, the world like, is wrestling with right now and so we don't want to we don't want to play Corona's out we want to you know be good stewards of space so we want to make sure you know our second stage is able to deorbit basically come down and not continue to float around and be another piece of junk to add to the issue so it deorbits itself it moves away from the space safely moves away from the spacecraft makes sure that you know there's no issue and um, it basically takes itself down. It'll splash down just southeast of uh, Hawaii in the empty area of the Pacific. Sure. South Pacific. That's the disposal Pausing area. Pausing now for a little bit of chatter that we're hearing uh, among the spacecraft team. Checking to see if they got that acquisition of signal, again, with the ground station in Karuna, Sweden. Yeah, and you're getting a, a good look at the... Kness Station there in France. SWAT, yeah. a joint mission between NASA and Kness. Yeah, so there's we're, a road uh, the space cast, guys. Teams, you see that? NASA it's teams, in the um, French uh, mission and control also room. The Kness team. And hopefully we'll we'll see an, another second round of, of cheering once they get that full suite of information there. Or at least a huge sigh of relief. <laughs> but it is already so reassuring that they got that initial. Yes. You know, absolutely. It's like, hi, I'm here. <laughs> yes, and, and that's and that's it's huge because you know you know your spacecraft is working well after after the, the the ride up to space. Yeah, I guess that initial acquisition, I guess, could be said as like, hi, I'm here, and then the full one is like, okay, now I'm ready to work. Yeah. Right? Is like, that now I'm checking out to... myself. I'm checking all my subsystems. I hey. Here's all the information you need to say, okay, we're working good, and um, we, we are ready to start our mission. Mm-hmm. And one good thing about acquisition of signal is, is uh, you know, there, there are a number of other ground stations that they could hit over the next couple of hours. This mm-hmm. is just that first opportunity. Right. And, yeah, there's ground stations little all around the globe. And once we're in range of any of them, we were able to acquire the data from the spacecraft. So right now we're pausing for some, listening to some spacecraft chatter. <laughs> we can't hear that then. So right now we're in range of the Karuna ground station. They have acquisition of signal, Karuna. And SWAT should be. And hope, we're hoping to get good confirmation, first information here uh, that the spacecraft is able to acquire that full suite moment. of data from the spacecraft. A hypersonic, it's A probably for the better. This launch is, you know, you, dude, this launch coverage is to get it to where cringe. it needs to go. It's bad. And for it to perform correctly. Like, yes. So this is that step to yep. say, hey, it's performing correctly. Yep. For NASA's LSP program, acquisition of signal is your your point of mission success, right? Yes. Yes, and that, that is the point that we know that the spacecraft, you know, the launch vehicle has done its job. And we just need to get that confirmation that the spacecraft is doing well. And this is the point in time where, you know, we're we waiting to kind of get that thumbs up from the spacecraft, say, hey, we're good. The spacecraft's looking good. And we're ready to start our mission. It, it's just the way SWAT they call the cast. SWAT stands for surface, water, and ocean topography. 
It's the first satellite mission to survey nearly all water on the Earth's surface with unprecedented detail and accuracy. You know, researchers, researchers want to understand how water resources are changing, you know, where the water is today, where it's coming from, and where it's going, and what impact those changes will have on local environments and also how the ocean reacts to and influences climate change. Because I, I learned from doing research on, on this mission. Where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? The water levels might be low. There you go just to make this extra cringe. It's amazing to kind of be a part of a nominal deorbit. That you got a nominal deorbit burn on the second stage. That, uh, in, you know, affects second humanity stage will burn up over the humanity. South Pacific. And we uh, just heard a call out a uh, nominal deorbit burn, yeah. right? That is correct. And that's basically, be as we mentioned for the before, occasion. the second stage kind of taken itself out of orbit so it doesn't, you know, remain a piece of junk. How does SWAT uh, actually work? In space, and that was basically Magnets. what we heard. The second stage essentially took itself out of orbit, did How a burn to kind of re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and to, uh, you know, impact somewhere southeast of it's Hawaii. Too early for that. Yeah, it's instead of just floating around there, that. like you said, space junk it, it, it is obviously an issue, especially when, you know, mm -hmm. you heard us talking about uh, earlier uh, in, in the broadcast Water, before fire, launch about dirt, collision maybe? avoidance. You know, yes, we, we have to watch and and mm -hmm. and uh, determine whether or not so, it's Kami. safe I, to fly considering they're... some of the junk that's that flying around out there. Yeah, every satellite and every piece of junk is tracked. Um, and, you know, and that's something we have to take into account. Anytime we, we're getting ready to launch, we have to know where all these different pieces of junk are so we don't, you know, fly too close or impact any of these items. And there's a look at the NASA management team <laughs> all waiting around, hopefully getting to get that confirmation from France that, their full passes went well, and they're able to acquire all the data um, required from the spacecraft. Yeah, as you said, we are within range of the ground station huh. we're trying to hit nice in uh, Karuna, Sweden. We now hear Kness over the audio loops, trying nice to contact good song. our NASA team. You sound like a talking head right now. It's uncontrolled the orbit, Gujar. Those rockets come down and they don't know where they're going to come down. They're not properly disposed of. And now, don't get me wrong. It's not like, oh, All please right. recycle. There you huh? go. We are you hearing know, the connect. The Long March 5, the Long March 5 core stages are on an unguided reentry. It's something about the size of like a tandem semi truck. And it's unguided and it can come down wherever. And if it comes down over a populated area, unguided. Yeah, they got a word for rockets that go up, come back down, and land in populated areas. They got words for those. They're not, the word isn't rockets. There's an acquisition, but we did have an acquisition of signal there, which is good. Everybody clapped. So, if it lands in your backyard, can you keep it? No. Space flight debris is uh, beholden to country of origin that it launched from. So, if, like, uh... If the space shuttle landed in Spain or something on a transatlantic abort, it's, it's ours. Yeah, something like that, Orion. Yep, yep. That's correct, Rocket Eyes. Yep. If it lands in Australia, we'll send you an angry fine for littering. Yeah. Y you know, Blinga, I... Can't put my finger on why, but I feel like that's happened before. No, yeah, I know it's Skylab. Yeah. I, I believe you, you know? What if it falls over a house? If it falls over to ha that's what I mean, ID. That's why you got to be careful. It's not, I'm sure that, I'm sure those, the NASA commentators have very interesting things to say. Um, like I said, they got a word for something that goes up into space, comes down and lands on people and hurts people. Those, those are called missiles. That's not space flight. That's dumb. That's that. That's missiles. You can say what it, you could call it whatever you want. An unguided piece of space debris that comes down and potentially has the, it has the potential to harm people is not is not space flight. That's that's not hum, that's not human space flight. That's not NASA. That, that's a missile. That's exactly what a missile does. 
So people, you know, there, there are other countries that are willing to do stuff like that. Uh, that's really messed up. That's really messed up. And, you know, if it comes down in a populated area and hurts people, guess what? You ain't launching rockets into space. Those are missiles. It doesn't matter if it's an unguided first stage or an actual missile. It's still going to come down and hurt people. That's not cool. That is not good for space flight. It's just like if there is a plane crash in the airline industry. It doesn't matter what plane it is. It doesn't matter who, what the operator is. Plane crashes are bad for the industry. See what I'm saying? So just because some boneheads don't want to deorbit their stages correctly because they're freaking too stupid to understand how to do it or something or whatever the reason, or they don't care, which is much more likely what's going on, uh, does it, that's ruining it for everybody. But anyway, sorry, I don't mean to. I don't mean to get so intense about this stuff. But that's that's not okay. <laughs> Shouldn't do that. You gotta properly dispose of your space debris so you don't hurt people. And more importantly, you well, not more importantly. This is kind of a secondary thing. You also don't want to clog up space with debris because it can make untenable debris clouds. So if you try to go and launch something into space, you'll just get hit by something on the way up. Gotta be careful about that stuff, man. I find it really hard to believe that they can launch a rocket in orbit, can't the orbit. It's more likely they don't care. But anyway, that was the SWAT launch. Hopefully we get some good data from that. They do have a telemetry acquisition, and now they have another... NASA showing another commercial on what it does. That's good. So, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I will be back in about four hours, give or take, uh, for the um, uh, for the stream. And we do have another Falcon 9 launch today, but uh, the Starlink mission did get moved to 4.30 in the afternoon tomorrow. Uh, so, we were going to have back-to-back -back 03 MB power, or 03 BM power, 1 and 2. And then Starlink 437. Starlink did move a day. So, yeah, the double launches we're not actually going to get today. But we do get O3BM power, which is sweet. That's going to be happening at 421. Oh, damn. I'm going to go get some shut eye. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys at noontime. Uh, we'll. We got another shuttle mission to launch in Kerbal, another Falcon 9. Actually, we got to go activate the ground stations. That's what we were doing. So we're going to be doing some Kerbin atmospheric missions in Kerbal, then the Falcon 9 launch, and then a shuttle mission, and then, uh, yeah, should be good after that. We got the first Tedris up last night, which was amazing. We're going to get the second one up today. And if we have time, we're going to try for the third one. So, yeah, should be good. From a pure technical standpoint, why are they uncontrolled? Can't relight the engines to make a precise re-entry? <clears throat> How difficult would it be for them to cut the engines and relight? Not hypersonic. They just don't care. Yeah, not having value on human life does that. What do you want? What's the status of the Soyuz leaf? Sig, I haven't heard anything. Yeah, Tessa, I, I agree. I didn't want to say anything, though. But I'm going to go get some sleep. I will see you guys in about four hours. Thank you very much for watching. Forgive me for being too much of a stick in the mud. I do apologize. I, should, I shouldn't do that. But you shouldn't go You shouldn't go talking about casters like that. But, man, sometimes, dude. Ugh. But I'll see you guys in about four. Thank you very much for watching. See you in a little bit. Thank you. Again, I already said that. Well, you know what? It's warranted. Thank you very much. Thanks for waking up with me. I appreciate it.